What do you find are the, the most common softwares that you reinstall for the aging process? The way to think of the body is that there's two types of information. Uh, one is the DNA, which we all know. The other part of the information, the other type in our body, unfortunately, is analog. Not the genetic, but the epigenetic information. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that I believe gets corrupted most rapidly. Are you one of the world's leading experts in aging or are you the leading expert in the, in the world on aging at this point? Oh, that's a pretty tough question to answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not the leading. There are hundreds of people who work on this topic. Yeah. Uh, as interesting as that is, um, you know, I've been working at this for now 30 years almost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I don't have a reputation yet, I've done something wrong. But, you know, I'm not going to say I'm the leading guy. I'm probably one of the most well-known mm. because I've been brave enough to go out in public and talk about it since I was in my 30s, even 20s. Mm -hmm. And my book that came out, that's also been uh, successful. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I am not going to stand up and say I am the greatest. Uh, you know, I'm not a Muhammad Ali kind of guy. <laughs> I'm Australian originally, and Australians definitely don't stick their head up above the yeah. poppy field. Tall poppy it, syndrome. Exactly, right. You get your head cut off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know a lot about that because we have a, a, a lot of Australians that listen to us that happen to be the, the number one business podcast in all of Australia. And I was like, I don't even know how all the Australians found me. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. But I, the thing I love about your book and everything that you talk about is you take age an aging process and actually kind of flip it on its head and think differently about it. But before we dive into to that specifically, when you look at aging, we think it's just something that we do. It's, we're just, it's something that we're going to, it's going to happen no matter what. But um, I'm curious uh, from the way that you, your, your perspective, the way that you describe it, why is it that humans actually age? Well, first of all, let's just get something straight. Just because something happens and it's natural doesn't mean it's good. Mm -hmm. 200 years ago, we thought you get cancer, you go home, pack your stuff and can't do much about it. Mm -hmm. But you develop medicines and you, you try to stop pain and suffering. Um, so that, you know, I regard aging as a disease, one that's treatable. Um, and that mindset is very important here. What is aging? Well, people have been trying to figure that out since before the pyramids uh, or even, you know, first block laid down there. So we don't know 100%, but what I put forth in my book is a, is a new theory that has become one of the hottest theories in the field. And that's the idea that it's not just things going wrong willy nilly. There's, if you boil it down, actually, you can make it into an, a mathematical equation. It's a loss of information. Hmm. And I think it's it's the good a good time. And the reason that it's being received well is because we live in an information age. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, people didn't really understand what that meant. But today we can understand that if the body's like a computer and the drives get corrupted uh, or the chips get corrupted and slow down, uh, that's aging. Um, and that what I think we can do is to reboot the system and reinstall new software and get it to work really well. Uh, and that's what we're working in, uh, on in my lab, which is to reinstall software into body parts uh, and we're finding that those body parts become young again, literally, uh, and work again like they were young. Yeah. And so what what do you find are the, the most common softwares that you reinstall for the aging process? Yeah. Well, you know, if you want a biology lesson, uh, you can read my book. I'm not going to go too much into it. But the way to think of the body is that there's two types of information. Uh, one is the DNA, which we all know. Mm -hmm. That's a digital form of information, very robust it's the reason we can talk uh, through the internet. The other part of the information, the other type in our body, unfortunately, is analog. You know, records, cassette tapes. This is not the kind of information that lasts for a long time. And we call that the, not the genetic, but the epigenetic information. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that I believe gets corrupted most rapidly. Now, the good news is, though, uh, let me switch analogies. It's not the best, but um, probably everyone knows what a CD is at this point. Uh, the, the music on a CD or the photos, that's digital information. But if you scratch the CD, that's like aging. The epigenome, the reading of the information is, is messed up. You can't read it. So songs skip. And in the body, the equivalent is that the genes that should be on and off in each part of the body, you know, your brain has to have a different set of genes on compared to your, your liver because otherwise the cells are going to be the same. We, we all have the same DNA in our cells. So now that, now that hopefully you understand what I think is going on, the scratches on the CD, we've been looking to polish the CD. So that's you know, a different analogy, but one that I think is apt. And what we do is we, 
We use gene therapy at this point. We turn on three particular genes that are normally only turned on in embryos to develop a very robust, healthy child. We turn them on in adult animals. So we're taking mice. They're old, they can't see, they're, they're blind. And we put those three genes into the back of the eye. We turn them on for three, four or five weeks. We can go as long as we want. And the eyes, they go back in time. The retina, the optic nerves literally become young. They don't just get healthier. We measure their age. We can measure that. We can measure the scratches. And when they're young, they get their eyesight back fully. First time that's been done to actually reverse aging. We think that we can do that probably in, in many other tissues. We're working on hearing uh, loss, um, some early results. We're going to work on uh, other parts of the body. So spleen, liver, and the most exciting part, uh, the one that keeps me up at night is whole body rejuvenation. Mm. Ima imagine a world where you either take a pill or a gene therapy, you fill your body with these three embryonic genes, and then you take uh, an antibiotic or some drug that turns it on. That's how we do it in the mice. We give them a doxycycline to turn it on. And then your doctor monitors you. Okay, you've gone back far enough in age, you know, I'm 51. Mm -hmm. Three weeks later, okay, David, you've gone back to 35. Do you want to keep going? Yeah, give me another 10 years. Go back. Stop right. it. You don't want to go too far. And then, you know, you arrange another visit 20 years later. So that that's what we're talking about theoretically, though it's early days because we're still in mice. Interesting. So <clears throat> I know that I hear, uh, I've heard Bruce Lipton talk a lot about epigenetics, and he talks about how the DNA matters, but in some cases, it seems like the epigenetics matter sometimes even more where it's, it, and the way to, I, guess, I guess he explains epigenetics is it's kind of like you have the DNA and you have the genes, but the epigenetics is kind of the environment that it is. And if you change the environment, it can be healthier for it or cancerous for it. But you're talking about not just changing the environment, but also taking new cells and new stuff and putting it into it directly, right? Yeah, that's that's essentially the, the, the right thing to to imagine but but it's a little bit better than that more exciting mm -hmm. what we've discovered is my colleagues and i is that the information to be young the dna is largely intact in our body we didn't realize that so the hardware is all there the information the main information digital is there it just doesn't get used mm. and what that means is that we can tap into it that aging is far more reversible than we ever thought and this epigenome has become one of the hottest things in biology right now, because you're right, it is affected by how we live. And you know, when, when you are overweight, you don't exercise, you uh, spend 20, 20 sitting in a chair, like a lot of us did, mm -hmm. uh, that affects your epigenome. And in good and bad ways, there are longevity genes that we study that if you have a sedentary lifestyle, don't uh, eat the right foods, those longevity genes get switched off and they don't protect your body. Conversely, uh, you, you know, you don't smoke, you, you exercise, you eat re rarely, I skip a meal at least a day. Mm -hmm. Then the longevity genes come on and protect your body and stop those and slow down those scratches from occurring. But the, here, here's one thing most people don't realize. We tend to think our DNA is our destiny. That's mm -hmm. totally wrong when it comes to aging. And we know this from studying tens of thousands of people measuring their clock over time. You 80% of what you experience in aging depends on how you live your life. And only 20% is your DNA from your parents. And that really is motivational. It should be to do all the right things. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a study that, that came out a couple of days ago and, and they were talking about COVID and they said that obviously the number one thing that's killing people is, is age. But the second thing seems like that, that the, the factors from obesity seem to be as well. So it looks like age, you know, it's funny because in the article, it says age is something that you can't do anything about. It looks like you would definitely want to go into debate about that. <laughs> and on the other side, it then talks about obesity and there's all, all the stuff that comes from that diabetes, um, you know, um, cardiovascular issues as well. So it seems like the actual two biggest issues now talking to you actually can be worked through to actually help people be healthier, boost their immune system and actually be able to, to fight it better, it seems. Well, they're, they're inextricably linked. Yeah. Obesity, heart disease, Alzheimer's. Uh, even cancer, these are manifestations of aging. And let's talk about obesity just for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, it's known that the clock of aging ticks faster if you're overweight, mm. right? And so it's not that obesity 
is just the problem. Mm -hmm. It's that your obesity is accelerating your aging. And that's why obesity causes a whole range of diseases, including cancer. Your body clock is ticking. So if you can lose that weight and your body clock will slow uh, down. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing to think about is what is the root cause of most suffering on the planet? What is the root cause of disease? Well, we know that for cancer, for example, the majority of the risk for cancer is aging, the processes that drive aging. We forget about that. We try to treat cancer after it occurs. We forget yeah. about the pre preceding 50 years that lead up to that typically. Yeah. Um, and you can have a big difference on your cancer rates. I'll give you one example. So my mother died of lung cancer. Uh, she smoked, which accelerated her clock. It mutated her DNA as well, which was not helpful. But her risk of getting cancer because of smoking went up fivefold above the average person Whereas going from age 20 to 70 increases your risk more than 200 fold. So which is more important to work on smoking or cancer? Well, I'd say do both, but we ignore the major cause of cancer in the world. Yeah. Which is people's environment, what they put in their body, how they take care of themselves. And one of the things that you said that, that I put down that I was really interested on, which I haven't heard you speak a whole lot about is just the, just being sedentary and just sitting all the time. Like that's one of the things that I'm, I'm, getting better at is every hour trying to get up and move in some sort of way. And, you know, the thing that I've heard it explained is, is like sitting is basically the new cancer. Um, what is, what is the issue with sitting so much and how do you see that happening in affecting the aging process? Well, I have personal experience of that. When I wrote my book, uh, which took 10 years, but I was literally sitting for about 18 months every day and night. Uh, I ended up suffering. I, my, my health went, um, I could barely walk because uh, my piriformis muscle atrophied and then seized up. It was in a cramp for six months. And that's the muscle that, that goes through that hole in your pelvis. Mm -hmm. um, and it took me six months of, of exercise and therapy to, to get back to walking again. So I've switched over to having a standing desk. Uh, it's right next to me just here. Uh, I go on a lot of walks. So why, why is sitting so bad? Well, first of all, your heart rate doesn't go up. You're basically mm -hmm. at minimal basal heart rate, which is bad. Second of all, if your major muscles atrophy, you're, if you're a man, you're gonna have less testosterone, but even for women, that l lack of muscle bulk is super bad. Not just because your, your hormones are diminished, but particularly those people who are my age and older, if you have weak muscles, it's super bad because A, it's very hard to get them back. Uh, it took me a lot of work and it's harder the older you get. Uh, but the number one, or maybe one of the top five, not number one, but one of the major causes, preventable causes of death is falling over and breaking your leg or your hip. And you've got to keep those muscles that are required for standing uh, really strong so that if you fall, you don't break, you just bounce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it seems like, you know, one of the things that, that that's happening is people are getting too comfortable, it seems, right? We're staying inside you know, inside of my house, it's at 72 degrees all the time. I can sit most of the day and do all that. But then also at the same time, it's like, you know, if you think about it, we don't put our body through enough stress. And, you know, I live in Austin. We had this, I don't know if you heard about the whole snowpocalypse thing where it's just like crazy. So our ancestors would have been outside in that. There would have been massive amounts of stress of going down to five degrees and all of that. But, you know, the thing that I'm I'm curious of and that I like to do is I like to, to kind of seek discomfort. Like I, I, I love... There's a lot of, and I don't even really do it, I guess, for the body effects. I actually do it more for the mindset effects of like really pushing myself and doing something that's uncomfortable. Um, one of the things, there's there's a couple of things I want to dive into with you on it, but one of the things is actually intermittent fasting, which I know you talk a lot about. Um, I'm really curious with what type of fasting people should do. You said that you normally skip one to two meals, what that looks like. Um, and then also long-term fasting, one day, two days, three days, because if people have done research, they talk about, you know, when you go three days or so, it seems like you, your body starts to clear out old dead cells and create new ones. So um, I'd really love to dive into fasting long-term and also intermittent fasting as well. Exactly. So th this is the concept that's most important uh, and always keep in your mind that your body isn't healthy if, it com if it's comfortable. Our mind wants to be comfortable. We want to sit and watch TV and eat popcorn, that's, that's very enjoyable. But if you always do that, uh, your, your mind and particularly your body will, will atrophy. So you do need to push it. You'd need to be uncomfortable at least part of the time and then you recover. 
Hey, did you know that monotasking is better for mental performance than multitasking? Or that simply cleaning your kitchen can reduce excessive snacking? And listening to happier music can help you think more creatively? These are just a few of the fascinating things that I picked up while watching Outsmart Yourself, brain-based strategies for a better you. Not only am I learning something new, but I'm also learning things about myself, which is a great feeling and super empowering. And with the Great Courses Plus, there's so many opportunities to learn and to feed your curiosity about virtually anything. You can speak a new language, learn how to play chess, dive into the history of World War II, or explore the universe and so much more. And you get unlimited access to hundreds of video and audio lectures from some of the best professors and top experts in the entire world. And with Great Courses Plus app, you can watch and listen on any device. So learn what you want, when you want to learn it, wherever you are in the world. And I want you to try The Great Courses Plus for yourself. I know you're going to love it. And right now, you can sign up for the quarterly plan and get an extra month for free. So just visit my special URL, which is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash dial. Don't miss out on this. Sign up and redeem your free month right now at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash dial. Hey, I know many of you are just starting out with buying a home, having babies, building wealth, but you got to make sure that securing your family future is on your to-do list by establishing a will or a trust at trustandwill.com. At trustandwill.com, setting up an estate is simple, convenient, and secure. And for as little as $39, you can nominate guardians for your children, determine who gets your stuff, and plan for future medical care, all from the comfort of your home. And hiring a traditional estate attorney can cost thousands of dollars, and using a one-size-fits-all template is not nearly specialized enough. Trust and Will documents are designed by estate planning experts and customized for the state that you live in. And as you get older, you realize how important it is to make sure that all of your stuff is buttoned up like this, which is why I'll be using Trust and Will as well. So gain peace of mind at trustandwill.com slash dial and get 10% plus free shipping on all of your customized legal documents. So don't wait. Go right now. Get 10% plus free shipping at trustandwill.com slash dial. That is trustandwill.com slash dial. So running for 10 minutes, uh, losing your breath is great. Being hungry once in a while is great. Being hot in a sauna has benefits. Even being cold, we think, can help. We call these these concepts, well, overall, they, they're called hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S, um, M-E-S-I-S. And the idea is that our bodies need a little bit of perceived adversity. Think of it this way. Uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And what's happening, we've discovered, comes back to these longevity genes that I mentioned earlier. We work on a set of seven genes called sirtuins. There are, there are others, but these ones control the scratches and they control your body's energy and fat content, your brain, Alzheimer's even, how, how fast that progresses. And here's the, the key thing. When you exercise, when you're hungry, these genes come on. They protect the body. They give you longer life, we think, and certainly health, increased health. But when you're sitting down, you don't do any of that stuff. They just say, hey, times are good. We don't need to work hard. Your body will not protect itself unless it actually thinks there's a threat to survival. So that's hormesis, and it's super important. So is that is hormesis the, the longevity gene that you're speaking of? Well, hormesis is the concept of keep your body in a stress state okay. every day, once in a while. But actually getting to your point, Rob, about being hungry in particular, mm -hmm. um, I've always tried to keep a, a lean weight. I just have known that that's healthier. So I've tried to do that. Uh, but I thought that eating small meals during the day was the way to go, because that's what nutritionists have said for at least most of the 20th century. Right. I don't believe that anymore. I think that the idea that you should always be satisfied and have snacks in between meals is wrong. I mean, certainly not not wrong for teenagers. We don't want malnutrition or starvation, heaven forbid. But what we're talking about is people 30, 40, 50 and beyond where metabolism is starting to slow down. You're already gaining weight if you eat three meals a day. You don't want to do that. So I skip breakfast. I often skip lunch. I have a normal dinner, uh, healthy greens and maybe a bit of meat. Um, mm -hmm. Though I've recently switched uh, to just fish as meat to see how that goes. Mm -hmm. But what's important is when you've got that hunger state, um, and you, know, you call it hunger, but I'm, I'm really never hungry. I'm used to this. After two weeks, you don't feel hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm drinking tea and coffee in the morning. It feels great, actually. I feel much better than bl being bloated. What's going on at the cellular level is a lot. Those longevity genes come on, and they turn on a process in particular called autophagy. You might call it autophagy, depending on where you live. And that is the process that grabs the old old proteins in the cell and digests them. We have a lot of old proteins that sit around and don't 
do a lot of good. In fact, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, that's the reason we get Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of misfolded old proteins, one called A-beta, for example. And our bodies need to chew those up to stay young and healthy. And a, a, a really good friend of mine and colleague down at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, her name is Maria Anna Cuervo, or Anna Maria Cuervo. You should uh, look her up if you're curious. She's the star of this, and she's discovered a type of autophagy that happens when you go hungry for three or more days. And it's called chaperone-mediated autophagy. And that's the deep cleanse. That grabs all of the really bad proteins and old ones that have crystallized and formed these tight uh, bundles that are very hard to get rid of um, and just chews them up. And mm. she has new work. Uh, I think it's coming out in the next few weeks, actually. She just had a nature paper. Now she's coming out with another big paper that says if you turn this process on in a mouse, it lives dramatically longer. Um, I, I think it was at least 20% longer and they're healthier. They look great. You look at a mouse that's got this and it's shiny and black coat and the other ones are gray and can barely walk. It's huge. And right now, the only way to stimulate that process is to go hungry or skip mm -hmm. meals, I should say, Rob. Um, but we're develop I'm, I'm working with Anna Maria uh, on a medicine that would give you know patients that kind of feeling so that older people, sick people, people in hospital, you know, obviously wouldn't have to uh, fast for three or more days. That's not necessarily what you want to have if you're recovering from a disease. But here's the point. You can induce hormesis with a pill. And that's what a lot of my companies work on. Interesting. So <clears throat> is there a fast that's too long? Because I've sat with a doctor before who said, you know, I was, I was talking about, about doing a 10 day water fast. And he's like, well, at that point in time, it actually starts to be, you know, you go, it, you're going so far that you're actually starting to do harm to your body. So is it three, four, five days that tends to be perfect to go into this hormesis? And then, um, you know, is there, t is, is it, is three days the, the amount of time that we at least want to go to, to get into that state? Like what is, what is the, the typical amount of time that you guys recommend? Yeah. Well, well, there's two mistakes in, in your sentences, unfortunately, uh, Rob. One <laughs> probably be a lot more without them for the rest of the interview. <laughs> no, it's totally inadvertent. I'm, I'm being a bit facetious. Uh, we don't recommend stuff. I definitely don't recommend stuff. Okay. I can tell you scientifically what's known. Right. And then the other mistake was we actually don't know. We're on the cusp of learning this, but mm. uh, we know that three days is good. Is five days optimal? Or do you start to lose muscle mass mm. too much? And uh, doctors like Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A, a good friend of mine, he's self-experimenting. He's got some patients, but we really don't know. We need more clinical trials to know that. Um, I would I would say that what I do is harmless. Three days, probably all good. Five days, I would start to think that any more than that would start to take away muscle mass, and you don't want to yeah. do that. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, one of the things that I've, I, I hear a lot of people talk about, and it seems like it's been very prevalent is, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, which you kind of spoke about for a second, Alzheimer's and dementia. <clears throat> My girlfriend, both of her uh, grandparents on her dad's side um, had either dementia or Alzheimer's as well. And that's one thing that she worries about for herself and then also for her father. So when you're saying these people don't go into this, if, if I'm understanding correctly, when they don't go into hormesis, basically they have old proteins and cells that are still inside of the body that the body hasn't flushed out. Is that what turns into the amyloid plaques that then d destroy the actual brain itself? Or is that something that's separate? And then in that case where somebody knows they have something, because there's a lot of people that have somebody that had a neurodegenerative disease in their family. Um, obviously we can't recommend, but the science, what does it say is best for that person knowing that that possibly you know, it could yeah. down, come down the line for them. All right. Well, first the diet, then the science. Uh, so the diet, I'm working with uh, Dean Ornish. You might mm -hmm. have heard of the Ornish diet. Mm -hmm. So Dean is, and I are with another five other scientists running in a clinical trial on Alzheimer's patients. And so far seeing dramatic results. Now his, his diet is lower on calories and focusing on plants um, and just really healthy food. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it seems to be working. Now, we'll publish this and we'll do more patients and get more data. But I think that that's the right approach is what he's saying. So if you want to look up the Ornish diet, I'd recommend doing that. O-N-O-R-N-I-S-H. Uh, now the science. Now there are misfolded proteins that accumulate in your brain they form these little crystals. Uh, A-beta I mentioned is one. alpha synuclein is, is another. And they're very hard to clear. It's thought that actually your body just cannot get rid of these crystals and you find them inside the cell um, and very much so outside the cell. Now there's been a lot of debate 
which is the worst form. Um, I think it's it's clear that some of these are bad for you, no doubt, because there's some therapies based on uh, the clearance of these proteins outside the cell using antibodies. And they're starting to see uh, some pretty promising results. But I'll tell you my view is that it's far easier to prevent them than to try to reverse them. And this is right. why it frustrates me that very few doctors focus on what you can do leading up to actually get it, getting the disease. And that's not just true for Alzheimer's disease, it's true for everything. Right. And I think doctors, because their training has been on, we only treat diseases, we're not preventative you know, medicine doctors, that's for the kooks. We need to change that attitude. <laughs> I mean, how, how many people's doctors spend half of the time with their patient talking about lifestyle, which mm -hmm. I would say, especially in midlife, is far more important than worrying about you know, what kind of flu you might be catching. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious also with that as well. Um, one of the things that I literally just got delivered yesterday, it's in my garage, is um, a sauna, so a traditional sauna. And um, also I do cold plunge therapy and usually I put a, you know, I talk about it all the time just for the, the mental benefits of pushing myself and doing it. And now it seems like they're starting to, you know, Wim Hof is starting to go viral and people are loving all this stuff and people are looking into it. Um, when you look at the, the hot cold therapy, heat shock proteins, all those types of things that, that come out when you do this, what are the benefits with hot and cold therapy um, that that you're noticing? And then also, what do you recommend for people who might decide to buy a sauna or might decide to start doing cold plunges? Is there a, too much? Is there too little that, that you find? Uh, well, again, we're, we're on the cutting edge and Wim Hof is right on the bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. uh, the science says that, yeah, turning on heat shock proteins uh, and, and hot temperature saunas in general do seem to have long-term benefits on health. There are some studies that I have referenced in my book, which people can go to to get more detail. But um, mm -hmm. typically it's in Finland where pretty much every house seems to have a, a sauna. If you look at people who do a lot of sauna bathing, they are protected. I think it was 30% less chance of heart having a heart attack late in life. So those studies are convincing. Actually, I was surprised how convincing the data is. Exactly how they work, we don't know. It might also involve the turning on of these longevity genes due to hormesis. The cold therapy is actually less known about, but the best explanation I can give right now is that there are longevity genes that respond to cold, not just hot. Mm -hmm. The sirtuin genes that I work on, there's, there's one called number three, sirtuin three, that comes on during cold and it's really healthy. It turns on the body's brown fat processes and burns energy, it revs up the mitochondria, the battery packs in the cell and brown fat, which we didn't even know existed 20 years ago in adults, it's usually baby fat. Babies cannot shiver, they have to use brown fat to get warm. Um, but adults can build it up, particularly on the back um, and other regions, it depends on how old you are and who you are. But being cold, you know, I bet you that Wim Hof has a ton of brown fat and that keeps his metabolism going. But also brown fat secretes these little hormones that are increasingly thought to be healthy as well. So it's not just your fat that's in good shape that your whole body gets the benefits long term. Hey, let me tell you about my favorite drink that I drink first thing in the morning. It's called Athletic Greens. Here's how I start my day. Go to the bathroom, brush my teeth, drink Athletic Greens, and then meditate. And in 30 seconds, with just one scoop, I get 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients, and has everything that a multivitamin has, plus greens, probiotics, prebiotics, digestive enzymes, immunity formula, adaptogens, and so much more. And I order it for my mom because I want to keep her immunity up right now, and I pay for it out of my own pocket. So if you're looking to upgrade your multivitamin or take just one nutritional formula that's going to help you cover all of your nutritional bases, then you want to get Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens makes getting as much high quality nutrition as possible incredibly easy without the need to buy multiple products. So make an investment in your health today and try the ultimate all-in-one wellness bundle and support your immunity, your gut health, and energy by visiting athleticgreens.com dial and you'll receive a full year of liquid vitamin D for free with your first purchase. Again, and that is athleticgreens.com slash dial. So, you know, most people are listening to that and they're like, well, I don't want more fat. <laughs> That's the exact opposite of what I want. But you're, that, you're talking about the brown fat, not the white fat is right. Well, yeah, it's not building up more fat. It's converting the fat in your body to become brown or beige. So, yeah, you don't build up fat. It's quite the opposite, actually. It'll make you thinner if you have, if you have more brown fat. So more brown fat will make you thinner. That's going to be a, uh, that, that's like a, <clears throat> people would never think that having more fat would make you thinner. But uh, from what I've heard also as well, is it seems like the brown fat you've said before has um, ener energy producing mitochondria that's in it as well. 
Oh, exactly. And and actually what happens is those mitochondria, when you get cold, can uncouple. Now, uncoupling uh, will extend the lifespan of flies and mice. And basically what uncoupling is, is that the body uses uh, some proteins called uncoupling proteins to uh, basically punch holes or let holes through the mitochondria. So a quick biology lesson, mitochondria are like a hydroelectric dam. There's a lot of water inside that gets let out. And as they pass through the hydroelectric turbine, they make energy. And uh, if you let the water through somewhere else, you're not going to be able to make as much energy. And in doing so, your body get that has the food in it, you know, you, you eat a, a muffin, it's not going to make as much energy. So it has to work harder. And you, you know, you expend more energy. What happens to the energy? Well, you know, physics laws of physics still apply. It comes out as heat. And so your body might go up 0.01 degree Fahrenheit or Celsius. It's very subtle. You don't feel it. And you, but you're expending more energy and that over the long run uh, leads to less weight gain. Hmm. Interesting. So one of the, uh, the things that you mentioned real quickly as well is, you know, mostly plants, but a little bit of fish is what you feel like you've switched to. So, you know, I always hear people talk about red meat's good for you. Red meat's bad for you. Stay away from pork. Stay from like there's, I mean, there's every possible thing you can think of obviously, but, um, what are you finding as far as if there, there's science around it between the fish, the chicken, the pork, the, the beef and how that either helps us with aging or actually holds us back with, with aging? Well, this is, this is a huge debate. Um, there's the carnivores who attack me on social media, uh, <laughs> kindly. I know, I know most of them, so it's, it's not vicious, uh, like it could be, but it's a healthy debate. Um, really, we don't know. There, there's some evidence that, at least in mice, you know, you, we're not mice, so fair is fair. But in mice, if we give them uh, a certain amount of protein, particularly meat-based protein, and there are chemicals in red meat that get converted, uh, can cause atherosclerosis. So that's one possibility that red meat is bad for you. Processed meat's definitely bad. The nitrates, there are carcinogens in there. So I try to avoid that, though. You know, Sunday piece of nibble on bacon is, is certainly fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm convinced by more than a mouse study even are epidemiological studies. You go to the world, uh, like Dan Butner has, the blue zones, and you look where are people the healthiest? Where don't they get cancer? Where do they live over 100 in, on average? And these blue zones, you look at what they eat. And they're typically eating, if you're in the Mediterranean, they're eating uh, a lot of vegetables, olive oil, getting a lot of exercise, fair amount of red wine. Um, and, you know, that, that sounds like my diet, right? Um, and it's not a bad diet to have. They might go fishing in the Mediterranean, pull out a fish and eat that. Some sardines, a lot of good oils in there. And the olive oil, by the way, actually, we found, or somebody else found, but we've confirmed, activates one of these longevity gene pathways that we study, the sirtuins, which is pretty cool, the idea that olive oil is good for you because it's turning on a longevity mechanism. But that's another story. Um, if you go to Okinawa, they have a really interesting diet too. There's a book that I love called the Okinawa program where they also, they exercise, they, they eat not a lot. They stop eating a meal at 70% full. Uh, they're, they're in the, in the fields. They have a social network. They eat a lot of plants and they only eat fish generally, maybe a little bit of pork, but not much. And that, they're the longest lived people on the planet. They, there's a lot of people out there that are still working the fields in their nineties and a hundred above. Wow. So all of that convinces me that um, the best bang for your buck is a more of a rabbit's than a, than a lion's diet. Right. You know, but then again, I'm not, you know, some people have a shock when they learn that I very occasionally, or I, I might eat some cheesecake or I might eat, you know, a steak. It's, it's not worth living if you can't eat the foods you love. I just try to limit it to special occasions and when I really feel like it. Now, if we're talking about, you know, stress and discomfort, is there benefit to every once in a while, once a week, once a month, whatever it is, to literally just going all out and going crazy and eating? Like, is there a benefit to that at all? Because we're talking about stressing the body in different ways. Is there benefit to just having a cheat day and yeah. just eating whatever you want or a cheat meal, passing out because you don't have enough energy because your body's got to digest it all. And then, you know, going back and not doing that for another month or so. Is there actual benefit or any science behind it at all? Uh, I haven't seen any signs behind it, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, you know, last weekend I had to spend uh, Sunday in bed, put it that way, uh, after a pretty big <laughs> night, but I don't think it does long-term harm if you do it once in a while. 
if you do it a lot, you're going to hurt your liver. You're going to build up fat in your liver, just mm -hmm. probably hurt some neurons in your brain. But once in a while, I mean, I do it because I love life, but you can also do it because you just need some mental relief. You can't always be so strict, I find. And probably the, the best effect on it is, is the fact that you know that you can have a bit of fun once in a while. And it's that mental uh, stress relief that, that it benefits. But I don't know. I don't think uh, a lot of food and a lot of uh, alcohol, I haven't seen any benefits. If I, if I find it, you know, you'll be the first to know. <laughs> so uh, one thing that I've heard you say that you do avoid though is sugars and carbs. I'm really curious with that, why you, you tend to avoid those. Well, I try to avoid them. I, I, I've learned, even through wearing a glucose monitor that di type 2 diabetics wear, what mm -hmm. foods trigger me. Now, we're all different. We have different microbiomes and whatever, genetics. Mm -hmm. So uh, I try to avoid things that shoot my blood sugar straight up. Now, cheesecake is not going to make me live longer. But again, you know, I don't do that that often. But generally, on a, during the week, I would try to avoid white rice, uh, white bread, even bread. I'm... I'm starting to wean myself off because that just shoots the sugar up. Mm -hmm. um, sushi, unfortunately, uh, I love sushi. That that still is bad for me. So what the reason that I do that actually is it, it's clear that having high blood sugar and continuous high blood sugar is bad in the long run. You can measure your long-term blood sugar levels. It's called HbA1c. It's what your doctor will test midlife to see if you've got type 2 diabetes. And that's basically glucose attached to your hemoglobin which is an average, as that goes up, it's perfectly, not perfectly, but as highly correlated with heart disease um, and of course, type two diabetes and even cancer. So you wanna, over your life, keep those levels relatively low on average. It can spike, it's not gonna kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I essentially gave up desserts at age 40. Mm -hmm. um, I say essentially, cause I, I do steal some and occasionally eat it, but probably most of the time I'd rather have a little piece of cheese um, instead. Um, and I think that's the best way to go. Low blood, lower blood sugar, um, lower HbA1c uh, will prevent glucose from binding to your proteins. Remember we were saying these proteins get misfolded and messed up. And um, so this is called uh, glycation and it happens during aging and you don't want it to happen. It's like cooking your food on the barbecue. It's, it's terrible stuff. Now you can get rid of it with fasting, but uh, in general, it's best not to accumulate this. So that's why I, I wouldn't say I totally avoid carbs. The other reason for avoiding carbs, by the way, is, you know, I enjoy food and the more the better. And if I don't eat a lot of carbs, then I can eat more food. Right? So I stick to foods, um, you know, that, that are full of flavor and I really enjoy. Uh, I'll admit something that I've never admitted publicly. If I put something in my mouth and I'm, I'm not at a, you know, a fancy restaurant that has no taste, tastes like crap, um, I will consider spitting it out because I would rather replace that with something that's really tasty. Right. It is, you know, this, this is not an eating disorder. This is just, you know, was that mouthful of whatever <laughs> worth it? I don't think so. That's awesome. I love that. The um, <clears throat> the thing that I'm real curious about, it, I've, I've never really asked anybody that's, that's come on is, is about three years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to go gluten free because she was having a lot of problems with eczema and started seeing like the, the gut biome and all of that stuff. Um, what's your thoughts around gluten? And um, is it something that you recommend that people avoid or is it something that you just feel like is, is uh, and I know it's different, it depends on where you are. Like you can, my mom has gluten issues. She can go to Italy and she can eat anything. Here she can't eat any gluten in America. So, I mean, what are your thoughts around gluten and consuming it? Well. I'm not the world's expert. I, I know enough to be dangerous here. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, gluten's an issue. Um, and cutting back on on grains in general, mm -hmm. um, certainly processed grains is a good thing for the reasons I just mentioned anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a sensitivity, no question. You can have it tested by your doctor and um, there's a lot of it. Um, the thing to remember is we're all, we all have different guts. Uh, we have different microbes, we have different sensitivities. Mm -hmm. And you know, I totally believe that, that gluten does harm to a lot of people. I don't know if it's the majority of people. I think there might be a lot of people who suspect a gluten sensitivity, whereas it's probably something else. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real thing and ha you can have it checked out and you can do self-experimentation like I do, because we're all different. We need to know if it works for us, whatever we're trying. 
And yeah, go go off gluten and see if you feel better. There's certainly no harm in that. Yeah. Um, I'm curious because we talked about cancer a little bit as well. And we also talked about Wim Hof. Um, is there any studies around breath work in, you know, over oxygenation? Because I know that from the stuff I've read that usually cancer, if you're, you're looking at the, the this place that it is, cancer tends to grow in an acidic environment. People talk about how if you're over oxygenated, that's an alkaline environment. Um, do you know of any anything around breath work and in, in over oxygenating the body that way? Well, yeah. So the Warburg effect is what it's called. And, and cancer cells love sugar um, and don't use a lot of oxygen for that reason. Mm -hmm. They're in a hypoxic state, whereas the opposite is hyperoxygenation. Mm -hmm. And now I, I don't think uh, that I've seen evidence that um, you know, just breathing a lot would make any difference, but you can do hyperbaric chamber mm -hmm. uh, therapy. And there is some really interesting data that just came out, not on cancer, but on, uh, what was it? It was uh, dementia, I believe. Um, and there's also there's a paper that came out looking at telomeres, the ends of the chromosomes that that represent your age and get shorter as you get older. Uh, they reversed that process with age, uh, just with some therapy in this hyperbaric oxygen chamber. So I think there's some merit to it. And I, I've done some work on this as well. We find that, um, I won't get too much into it, but having, uh, as you get older, your muscles get tricked into thinking that there's not enough oxygen around. Mm -hmm. They become hypoxic mm -hmm. and that they shut their own mitochondria down because they think, oh, this person's not breathing enough. They've gone to the top of Mount Everest, so they don't, don't make mm -hmm. as much mitochondria. Uh, the problem there is that your body's in a state of hypoxia, which is bad. You don't make mitochondria, you don't make energy you feel probably, you feel lethargic. And we found that by blocking that process and getting the cells back in a couple of weeks to feeling normal, uh, mice could now run twice as far on a treadmill. They were super healthy, super fit, had the energy back. And so, yeah, it's this oxygen stuff and mitochondria is intimately linked to aging. Um, and the older you get, the less uh, um, mitochondrial activity you have now. You can boost that up again, probably by exercising, uh, by being a bit cold, um, and perhaps even by heavy breathing. That part I don't know about, but it's really important. Um, and I think it's the future for a lot of uh, therapies, given what I've seen. Interesting. So it's fun because I feel like you're, you're like right on the cusp of all of the stuff that was weird five years ago, you know, like people were making fun of and it's like, Oh, this actually could have some sort of merit to it. So it seems like cold therapy was made fun of going in saunas was made fun of breathing was made fun of fasting was made fun of all of these things were made fun of, but it seems like the core of it is really putting your body under some form of stress because when it gets too comfortable is where it becomes an issue. So it's finding some, part throughout the day where you, I mean, even if I'm thinking about it, you're talking about being sedentary, I'm thinking like, all right, if I'm sitting down watching Netflix, should I jump up and do like, you know, 50 jumping jacks and 50 push-ups, and then go, all right, now I can go back to watching Netflix every hour. Is that like, is that, that's probably even more beneficial than just sitting there watching Netflix for an hour, an hour and a half. Right. Well, well yeah, that, that's a little extreme. Um, hopefully you're not <laughs> cuddling with somebody under a blanket at that point. Uh, but you know, sometime during the day you should be, moving if, it, if you're older just go on a on a walk if you're if you feel like getting on a treadmill for a few seconds or for 10 minutes that's fine mm -hmm. uh, i do a fair amount of weightlifting um you know despite what you might think and that is also important long term um your body your muscles in particular will secrete hormones that have long-term benefits as well and allow you to eat more uh, and burn fat so all of that is good you do want to do it um but you need rest as well. Don't forget, you can't run a marathon every day and expect to be healthy. Right. Uh, and so I have days of rest as well. Uh, and that's when you should watch Netflix. Yeah, <laughs> and on the rest days. On the rest days, we're eating all that you possibly can, right? <laughs> um, yeah, once in a while. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that's the thing that uh, that's going to help. I put up a, a question that I had a, I had a feeling. And number one, I have a feeling I know your answer. Number two, I had a feeling I, I knew what the question back would be ever, ever, from everybody would be. I put up on my Instagram and I was like, hey, I'm going to talk to him. You know, uh, one of the, uh, the, the front runners as far as uh, anti-aging and aging in general, what questions do you have? And you might not be surprised by this question. The number one question that came back 
was from a lot of women and it said what to put on their face to, to remove lines. Yeah. I have a feeling I know your answer is going to be around this. So it probably has something to do with besides just putting something on your face. But with the look of aging, yeah. what, uh, what helps with that? Uh, yeah, well, so I, I have a fair number of, uh, of, of VIP clients who are mm-hmm. asking me these same questions. The, the good news is that if you do what I, what I do, mm-hmm. um, probably what's happening is your whole body will, will stay healthier and younger and your mm-hmm. skin is a very large organ, if not the largest. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can start on the inside. You don't need to slather yourself with stuff. Yep. Um, I don't know, you, you can judge me, I'm 51, so I haven't got a gray hair yet, um, and I don't think I've lost much either. So, you know, that's an, what we call an N of one clinical trial, not exactly helpful, but I do believe that you should start on the inside. Um, and you can apply things from the outside. There are, I mean, the, the easiest thing to do is just avoid the sun. Um, I grew up in Australia, unfortunately, when it was fashionable to get burnt. That's gonna come back to haunt me. So avoid, avoid the sun. Um, Take vitamin D. That's also very good long term for health and the skin. Mm-hmm. Um, there's uh, you know retinol, which actually does work. Uh, I would say that's something that a lot of people already know. Uh, there are creams that are purported to raise NAD levels. NAD is a molecule we work on in my lab, and that's the fuel for these sirtuins that I've talked about. These longevity genes, and actually, actually, as we get older the NAD levels in the skin go go down by about twofold. So in my 50s, I'm 51, as I said, I would have roughly half the levels as I did when I was 20. So maybe you can raise the levels of NAD in the skin with a cream. Uh, instead, I, I take a, a pill that raises my NAD levels. I talk about it in the book, page 304, if you want to learn all that stuff. Um, I think it's possible to slow aging in the skin. Um, you know, And then it, if that doesn't work, there's always uh, the other cosmetic stuff. But, uh, you know, I think you want to start early in life. You know, once you're in your 30s, when I, when I started, it's a long-term program. You cannot expect to start at 45 and instantly reverse the effects. Yeah, I had a feeling you were going to say it started from the inside out. There's not a whole lot of <clears throat> magic effects that actually takes... But people want the fix-all. They want to, They just want to fix it and look young immediately. But um, I'm curious, with with that and in, in, with skin in general, um, what do you know about red light therapy? Uh, around the skin and in producing mitochondria as well. Yeah, I, I think it's got legs as a scientist. I tried to extend the lifespan of nematode worms with this red light in my lab. It didn't work, but I haven't given up given up on it yet. Um, I think there's something to the red light therapy. There's some reasonable data on uh, what is it, hair growth uh, from this. So probably. There's something going on, but it's really not well studied. We need a lot more. Uh, I've seen that you can buy these red lights. Um, someone even sent me one, to be honest. I haven't used it much, but uh, I think that there's there's good reason to think that certain wavelengths could trigger your body into a hormesis effect. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think well, where I stand on that is we need more research, but I doubt that it's doing harm. Right. So I'm curious because you said something, I want to get really clear on it. You said avoid the sun. Now, do you mean completely avoid the sun or do you mean, you know, avoid getting burned? Because a lot of people are going to be like, he said, don't go out. So I'm not going to go out. Yeah. But I've also heard that being, having at least some sunlight triggers, you know, turns off like between turns on or off like 300 switches inside of your brain and your body and all of this stuff. So, so with sunlight and getting the vitamin D from sunlight, but also taking it um, as you recommended, um, what is what is your recommendation around sunlight? Yeah, well, <clears throat> disclaimer, I don't recommend stuff, but what I can tell you is that... Right. No recommendations. Well, what does the science say around sunlight? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Rob. Thanks for bringing that up. Maybe I, I misspoke. What I meant to say was uh, don't stay in the sun long enough for there to be irreversible damage. So okay. a little bit of sunlight is good. I'm, I walk out, haven't been out that much because it's middle of winter here in Boston, but yeah, some sunshine is fine, but but don't do it for you know more. It depends on the UV, but I would these days because I'm you know pasty as much as a you know a vampire would be. I would I don't want to spend more than half an hour out there in the sun. That's enough. But think of it as a competition between DNA damage. What's happening with the sunlight is your DNA gets crosslinked, and your body has to come in and take out those crosslinks and put a new piece of DNA in, and your body takes time to do that. 
And the older you get, the worse it gets, the, the slower it is. And it's a balance of damage, repair, damage, repair. And if you don't repair it, you get mutations and epigenetic changes too, don't forget. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do is, I, you know, get a bit of sun. It's healthy for sure. You get a bit of a, a tanning effect too. But if you stay red, you've overdone it. Uh, your body right. can't cope and it's got inflammation. So yeah, limit it. But, you know, I, I wasn't trying to say live in your basement for the rest of your life. I'm eager to get out. This uh, pandemic has been pretty uh, harsh on, on yeah. myself and all of us. Yeah. Um, so I've heard you talk about, you know, NAD, NMM, a, a few different other things as well, a lot of the podcasts. But one thing that I've heard a lot about recently, maybe just because of people that I hang out with, is something called BPC-157. Um, for it's a peptide that you inject into different parts of your body that you want to regrow, but also like joints as well. Have you heard any of the science around BPC-157 at all? Well, I hear it a lot. Uh, people ask me that. Um, I don't know enough even to talk about it uh, with mm -hmm. any authority. Um, I'm sure it has uh, has effects because athletes uh, have taken it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not approved for human clinical use by any authority. Right. Um, and it's thought there may be some negative effects. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's on a prohibited list, um, depending on waiting on new research. Um, also, athletes, they, it, it's part of that doping test. It's, uh, yeah. there's, there's tests getting developed. So I don't know uh, enough. I mean, maybe you do uh, to say something about it. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm authority in it. I don't recommend anything either. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing I want to make sure of. Um, so we've covered a lot of different things. And so I know everyone's, there's a lot of different things we've jumped around in. But, you know, if we're saying, okay, for the typical person, I'm 35, about to be 35 years old, right? Um, if, if we're going through and we're saying the science, uh, as far as sleep to waking up to the stresses to put my body through, the type of stuff to eat, the fasting, how often to do all of it, what is a typical, as far as the science says, what would, what would a typical really day, good day look like as far as the stress we put our bodies through, the stuff that we eat, how often we eat, does it matter when we eat, and then also how much sleep we should have. And if there is a time of when we should go to bed, we should not get better if, if none of that actually matters. Uh, it all matters. Um, but again, don't, don't be so strict on yourself because you, mm -hmm. you'll stress about not sleeping. That, that can right. backfire. Well, let's see. Let's start with a typical day for me. Uh, get up, uh, shower. I'll have a cup of tea or coffee. A little bit of milk doesn't hurt. A bit of stevia certainly doesn't hurt. hurt. Um, I will most days have a little, little piece of, not piece, spoonfuls of yogurt. Uh, probably a Greek yogurt or one I make myself. And I sprinkle in about a gram of resveratrol. This is the molecule in red wine that we discovered activates the sirtuins, um, going back to 2003 now. But if anyone you know, hears that red wine is good for your slowing your aging, that's, that's our lab. So I do that. I've been doing that for a, a long time. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, when we published that in Nature back then, red wine sales went up 30% and have oh sta God. stayed up. So you're welcome, uh, red wine industry. <laughs> So I do that, and then uh, then I go hungry. You know, I'm not hungry. I, I fast probably until late afternoon, or go all the way to dinner. During the day, I'll try to stand up. I'll go on a walk. I'll go to the gym maybe once every three days. Lift some weights. Run on a treadmill for five ten minutes, um, and that's a good day for me. When it comes to the night, it's very important to dim the lights. You and I are looking into the screen all day. I've got lights here on my face. It's bad, really bad, this blue light in particular. And so I dim that at night automatically on my phone or my computer. There's a piece of software called F.Lux, which is great mm -hmm. for computing. Uh, I wear those um, yellow glasses to block out the, the blue light if I watch TV. And I try not to do a lot of computing after 10 o'clock at night, though it's, it's difficult, right? We're all on our phones. And then I try to get to sleep. Then, you know, I, I, I practice uh, breathing and try to calm down because I'm going at 200 miles an hour every day. Mm -hmm. And I try to get a good night's sleep every night if I can. I typically do. I know if I do because I've got this aura ring on. And uh, that's a good day. So why do all that? Well, hormesis and even the sleep-wake cycle. It's important that I take my NMN, which is the NAD booster. I, you know, this is my part of my breakfast. Mm -hmm. That's the NAD boosting molecule, which we're testing clinical trials right now. Any of my colleagues who say, 
I'm just experimenting. Now, this is, we have clinical data at this point. Uh, it's not a medicine yet, but hopefully it will be. So there's that, there's Veritrol. That's in the morning. So I get this, I feel this, this boost and it sustains through the day. But then at night, I need to come down. The NAD levels would come down by then. And I get a good night's sleep, which is important. We know that that cycle, the sleep-wake cycle, we call it the circadian rhythm, is intimately con connected with longevity. If you mess up sleep in an animal, within a few weeks, it's got type 2 diabetes um, and it'll, it'll age more rapidly. Conversely, as you get older, your sleep-wake cycle will get messed up. You know, how many people have a grandparent who doesn't sleep well? That's mm -hmm. in part because this NAD cycle that we have during our day naturally uh, gets flatter and you don't feel as tired and you wake up in the middle of the night. Long way of saying, get exercise, skip a few meals, one a day, don't need a lot of snacks and get a good night's rest. Love that. Um, last thing I want to dive into that we spoke about right before everything we started recording, which was uh, death just in general. And we we connected in a weird way around the fact that we just actually think that death is something that actually drives us. And um, and I'd love for you to share kind of your viewpoint on, you know, we talked about carpe diem and we also talked about just viewing our lives as if it's already happened and we already have died. So um, if you'd share with that, since this is a mindset mentor and I want to dive into the mindset of everybody, if you'd share kind of your viewpoint on that, because I thought it was really interesting. Right. Well, anybody who listens to your, pod your podcast knows that you've been through some hell too. Uh, yeah. I by the time you're my age at 50, you, you've seen a lot. Um, and most of us have seen at least one of our parents pass away. A few years ago, it's probably going back five years now, um, I watched my mother pass away. She had lung cancer, had her lung removed, survived for, for 20 years, actually. Um, maybe Resveratrol had something to do with it, but she, she really did do well. But then her remaining lung gave out. So I flew to Australia to be by her bedside. Fortunately, she didn't die during that flight. I wrote the eulogy for her funeral. I thought this was it. Uh, arrived, she sat up, she was happy. I said, hey, mom, do you want to hear the eulogy that I wrote? It's uh, really, I think you'd get a laugh. Uh, and she laughed, it was great. Uh, it was probably five minutes later. I hadn't had a chance to read it to her. She coughed, her lungs became congested. There was fluid in them. Um, and I, I literally watched my mother wide-eyed suffocate to death in front of me. It only took about a minute. I only had time to start screaming at the nurses and the doctors to get help. Right. They said, there's nothing we can do. Uh, and I whispered in her ear, uh, mom, you're the best mom I could ever hope for. Thanks for everything. And, uh, you know, you see that as a kid, as a, you know, as, as a human being. Mm -hmm. First of all, my, my first thought was seeing her uh, writhe on, on the bed like, like a dying lizard. You know, that, that's something that no one tells you about. You know, sorry if I've, you know, told everybody here and you didn't want to hear it. Often death is not a pleasant thing. Uh, it can be horrific. And my mother suffered that way. And, uh, you know, we, we got to live life, first of all, like every day could be our last. Um, and there will be a last day. We will take our last breath. That's, that's a fact. Um, and then when you see something horrible like that, I live life like it's a great day if somebody hasn't died. When you see something like that, there is no such thing as a bad day. All right, so I, I, I still get home and, you know, how was your day? The kids will ask and I'll say, it was a great day. Nobody died. And that, that's my bar. And that's why every day to me is a blessing and I'm super optimistic about things. Carpe diem, I live that every day. And the other thing I like to think about is I live like, life like I died years ago. Um, I've had some close miss, close calls. I drive my car a little too fast. Um, I drive uh, one of Elon's uh, Tesla vehicles. Um, and I, I regard myself as having died. And I live my life like, hey, every day is an extra day that I got. And that also helps. I love that. Well, thank you for sharing that. That was, yeah, I've, I've been in the room when someone passes away and there is, I, I've never been in the room when someone's birthed yet. I've heard that's quite amazing. But to be in the room when someone passes away is a life-changing experience. And it really changes the way that you think of everything. I was in the, in the room when my grandfather passed away, my myself and my cousin. And it was just like, it was an interesting thing to go through. But I also felt so blessed to have been in the room when it happened because it changed even more my viewpoint on life and death as well. Yeah, it really does. And 
you know, I don't want anyone to have to go through something like that if they don't have to. Mm -hmm. But if you do, it, it certainly gives you this different view about mortality, your own mortality, right? Mm -hmm. You know what's coming. I don't, I don't live in fear, Rob, I'm sure you don't, but, but we live life with energy, yep. with the thought that every day is a gift and there will be one day we'll, when they run out. And I, I think you're the same. We want to do the most to leave this world a better place. 100%. Love it. Well, uh, Dr. David Sinclair, um, I know you have an amazing book, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Need To, but um, where else can people find you? So there's obviously your book people can, can consume, but where else can people find you if they want to learn a little bit more? Uh, well, of course, on social media, um, I'm fairly active on Twitter. So I'm there at David, uh, David A. Sinclair. I'm on Instagram, occasionally post some videos and some tidbits on that. Little mm -hmm. In, in insights into my life and my lab there. Uh, more detail, I have a newsletter you can sign up for that is on a uh, website, lifespanbook.com, lifespanbook.com. Uh, I also have an illustrated uh, section to my book. So if you buy the Audible version, you can download the PDF that comes with it. There's a glossary, illustrated glossary. There's there's a cast of characters that I actually drew all of the, the characters that had to do their headshots by hand due to copyright. Um, so there's all that. And there's a Q&A. You can sign up for the newsletter there. Um, I'm working on a second book, which actually talks more about hormesis and what we can do. But a, a lot of the book is, is about why we're aging. But half of the book, well, at least a third, is about what you can do now to slow that process and, and look better and feel better by the time you hit my age and beyond. Amazing. Dr. David Sinclair, Claire, I uh, appreciate your time, man. It's been great. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to learn a lot from, uh, from all of this because it was, it's, it's definitely a different perspective of going, you know what, we can look at this differently and we can actually try to slow or reverse this aging process down. And man, if you're putting out, uh, if you're putting out books, you're gonna have to keep putting out books with all the research and stuff that's coming down the line. It seems like in the next five or 10 years, possibly. Well, that, this is the reason I have to. So we, we made a discovery that, that hit the cover of nature. Um, hopefully this isn't too egotistical, but it's pretty, pretty fun. So we got the cover of Nature magazine in December. And this talks about like the, the biggest thing that you could get. And that's like the, the top of the top is Nature magazine, right? For, for people who are doctors and scientists and work in your field. Well, I mean, you can win a Nobel Prize, but, but that's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, that was a highlight and I had a fantastic team that was able to show how to get rid of those scratches on the CD and that was the work that we showed could uh, reverse blindness in, in old age and the first time safely reset the age of an animal's tissue in vivo in the actual living animal without causing any issues. So the exciting part is, is that and the reason I'm writing a second and probably a third book is that this field is going so quickly. Mm -hmm. Five years ago and I started saying, uh, not just delaying aging, but we could reverse it. And a lot of my Harvard colleagues and elsewhere screwed up their face. Here goes Sinclair again. He's going off in a dream world. You know, I'm happy to say that the science has caught up to that. And uh, like you said, it's no longer crazy to think and even dream about what the future looks like. It's amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Rob, it's been great. Thanks for doing what you do. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you love this video, I've got another one you're gonna love. Just click right here and watch it.